Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned that, uh, so this topic is quite important in terms of uh, the practical importance that is having and also the uh, importance from examinations point of view. Uh, this is quite uh, important topic. Uh, so when it comes to the exam, you know, uh, from this, we used to ask questions in financial instruments uh, like 30 mark question. So in the last time, if I reflect on uh, our experience, so we have tested this financial instrument for 30 marks. But interestingly, so the last couple of years, uh, we are seeing that uh, there's improvement uh, in the student's answer when it comes to this financial instrument uh, questions. So there we believe that uh, so our experience, what we had like uh, five years ago. So if I reflect on that, uh, that was totally different. So when it comes to the financial instrument question, that is one of the question that the student have uh, obtained very less marks. Say out of 25, the students used to score uh, the, the average mark the students were obtaining was like 10 marks out of 25. So that means there's a clear loss of 15 marks. So then, then it definitely make it difficult for you to go for a good grade. So having identified that, so what we have done, we have dedicated uh, several tutorial on this. So having identified that particular uh, importance, so we have dedicated several tutorials and we extensively work out the questions and also the past paper questions we used to work out. So then, uh, the what we experience today is somewhat different to what we used to have. So we believe, we strongly believe that. So these tutorials were uh, somewhat helpful for you uh, when you are going for a good grade. Hence, I uh, would like to invite. So make sure to participate in these tutorial sessions, right? And try to make the maximum out of this. And we believe that since you all are in a kind of uh, we are meeting in a kind of distance mode so it uh, may facilitate for you to join the sessions so even uh, being a saturday saturday evening right so if it was a kind of physical interaction so i know that so it's quite difficult or you find it hard to come to the university and participate in these lectures but now you cannot have that particular claim from your side because now we have turned out the things to online platform, right? We have converted, or we had to, we had to switch to this online platform. Hence, uh, you cannot have that particular claim. So make sure to participate in these sessions and try to make the maximum out of that. Okay. So having said that, uh, let us uh, have a look at the tutorial. So the first question is uh, basically directed to check your knowledge on the definition of financial instrument. So before I go to this question, so would like to discuss with you, uh, what is a financial instrument? So as per the standards, you would have learned, or you would have exposed to the definition of a financial instrument. What was that? So when come to the financial instrument, yeah. So we, uh, you would have discussed that. Uh, so in a financial instrument, it's necessarily a result of a contract. It's a result of a contract. If it is to be a contract, you know, there must be two parties. In order to have a contract, at least there must be two parties, no? So in this, the one party, we call it the holder, while the other party is called the issuer. So these are the two parties, the holder and the issuer. Then when it comes to this definition on financial instrument, it says that financial instrument is a contract, it's a contract that gives rise to financial asset to one entity and financial liability or equity to another entity. So that's how it defines, right? Pretty straightforward. It says that it gives one entity 
the financial asset the financial asset who is getting that and that's what we call the hold of the instrument hold of the financial instrument while the other party is having financial liability liability or even it can be a equity instrument equity instrument. or let's say equity so financial liability or equity so that is from the issuer's point of view so when it comes to the financial instrument the most important thing it's a contract so if it is a contract it's all about contractual rights and obligation contractual rights and obligation no? most important thing of a contract is going to be the contractual contractual rights it gives the contractual rights and also it gives rise to contractual obligations contractual obligations right so this is the key it's a contract contract so it means contractual rights and obligation to the parties to the contract so if i'm to take a, a very classic example that uh, to explain this financial instrument so if you can imagine of investing uh, if you can imagine of investing of the debentures of another entity let's say that uh, let's call this the bplc and let's call this the aplc right so in this scenario let's say that aplc has invested in rupees invested in rupees 5 million 5 million in debentures let's say something like this so then if you take this particular transaction the debentures so from the ace point of view they have invested rupees 5 million in debentures what is that that is their investment in debt instrument so it's an investment in debt instrument so it's a financial asset so you are the holder from the issuer's point of view what is that so it's rupees 5 million debentures rupees 5 million debentures then what is that so it's going to be necessarily the financial liability so if you take this particular debenture transaction we can see it gives rise to a financial asset to the holder while it gives rise to the financial liability to the issuer similarly if i take another example let's say that entity aplc invest in shares right they invest rupees 10 million rupees 10 million in shares in shares of aplc so what if they invest rupees 10 million in the shares of bplc so in that it is most of the time they may be purchasing these shares from the secondary market but in order to purchase that uh, this bplc uh, should have issued these shares so bplc is the one who would have issued right so if you look at this transaction from the two parties point of view from the holders point of view so if they invest in shares of bplc yes that is investment in shares and it's a asset and it is a financial asset from the issuer's point of view if you take the bplc situation so if you had issued ordinary shares you know it is something that represent the residual interest the residual interest so when it comes to the equity there is no obligation from the issuer's point of view there's no obligation so if things go wrong uh, the company so it is not responsible to do any so therefore it's simply a residual interest so the distinguishing feature of financial liability and equity you would have discussed in a financial liability there is a contractual obligation so the present obligation is there so you know that is the case for any liability you know isn't it for any liability that is the case the present obligation present obligation but when it comes to a financial liability that present obligation is a contractual obligation 
contractual obligation. So it's a form of one form of present obligation. So this is something that you have learned uh, since your first year. The present obligation, we divide that into two categories, the legal obligation and the constructive obligation. And when we come to the legal obligation under that, uh, one of such legal obligation is going to be the contractual obligation, right? So that come into existence as a matter of contract, as a matter of contract. So it's about the contractual obligation. But when it comes to the equity, you would see that no obligation, no obligation at all. No obligation, it simply represent the residual interest, the residual interest. Then, so when you come to this issue of shares, so it is clearly the equity. So it's equity to the issuer, to the holder, that is investment, right? So this is basically what we call the financial instrument. So it's a contract which give rise to financial asset to one entity, while it give rise to financial liability or equity to the other entity. So this is how we define it, right? Okay, having that on mind, if we have a look at the tutorial, so shall we try out the first question? So with that in mind, give it a try. So there it asks you, identify which of the following items fall within the definition of financial instrument. You are given several items, then it asks whether it's a financial instrument or not. And uh, also you are supposed to reason out that. So what is the reason why you say that it is a financial instrument? So can you give it a try? Take uh, some time here yeah? and you can indicate your answers in the chat and then be able to uh, see and discuss it. Okay, good. So you have tried that in no time. Wow. Yes, uh, says that uh, the first one, yes. Wow, yes, you're perfectly correct. Good job. In no time. Appreciated, right? Good. So likewise, would like to see more attempts, more attempts on this, yeah. One or two attempts, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, correct. Go ahead. Take two to three minutes time. And indicate your answers.
Okay, good. So more, more items are coming on. Appreciate it, yeah. Good. Okay. Appreciate it. Right, okay. So shall we take one by one? So what about the first one? The trade receivable? So is it a financial instrument or not? Yes, as most of you have indicated, yes, it's a financial instrument. Good. So why is that? Why we call it uh, a financial instrument? The reason that would be the most important thing. There must be a kind of a ground to say why it's a financial instrument. Because it represents the contractual right to receive cash. Contractual right to receive cash. If you have a contractual right to receive cash or another financial instrument, yes, it's a financial instrument. So here it does. So it's a financial asset. Investment in order to share. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Because the standard itself says that if you have equity instrument in another entity, uh, yes, it's a financial instrument. Because the definition itself captures that. So uh, the investment in equity instrument, equity instrument of another entity. The instrument of another entity, no? Another entity. So that is the case. Payment for goods or services. What about that? Prepaid, sorry. Prepayment for goods or services. So it's a little tricky one here. So, so that most of you have managed to get that. So would like even others to involve because uh, you know the tutorial has to be something interactive and this is not a kind of a lecture right so this must be a kind of interactive session so you may come up with the ideas no problem whether it's correct or wrong it's not a problem yeah prepayment for goods or services what is that okay good Very correct, very correct. You have reason out even correctly. Yes, it's not a financial instrument. The reason is that it gives you a contractual right, but it's true, but that particular contractual right is not for the cash or financial instrument. Because here it gives you a contractual right, no problem. But it is not for the cash or another financial instrument, but to receive but to receive what? Goods or services. Goods or services. So you may be having a contractual right. So if you make kind of prepayment, so prepayment for goods, prepayment for services, you have the contractual right, but that is to receive goods or services. But definition does not capture that. Good. What about the next one? Again, it's a kind of a very interesting one here. Yeah? So liability for income taxes. What about that? Liability for income taxes? Yeah. Says that. Good. Very good. Very correct. So you have reason out it nicely. No. The reason is that because it gives a kind of a, it's a kind of a obligation is there, but it's not contractual obligation, rather it's a statutory, statutory obligation, very correct. Obligation. Statutory obligation. Good, very correct. Investment in uh, subsidiaries here. Yeah? Investment in subsidiaries, yes. What is that? Very correct, very correct. So you can see that uh, 
when it comes to investment in subsidiaries, basically uh, an entity becomes a subsidiary. So when you invest in shares, so when you invest in majority of the shares, so you get the control. So consequently, the entity with, over which you get the control, it becomes a subsidiary. So therefore, here, uh, in essence, the equity instrument of another entity involves. So it appears, so it appears to be a financial instrument, right? In fact, it does because it's a equity instrument of another entity. But the problem is, the financial instrument standard scope out this kind of investment because there is another dedicated standard on that. So when you come to deal with the investment in subsidiaries, you have SLFRS 10 and SLFRS 3. So they take care about that. Hence, the SLFRS 9 need not to worry about that. So if the investment goes beyond the majority of the shares, so if the investment takes up to the majority of the shares, then that is taken care of by the other standard. So we can say it's no. So the simple reason is that it's scoped out, scoped out, out from financial instrument standard. Standards. And it's taken care of by SLFRS 3 and SLFRS 10. You have learned them extensively, isn't it? In your second year, you have learned them extensively. Right? It's not financial instrument, but it is investment in subsidiary, a separate one. Good. So how about uh, the other one? The investment in associates and joint ventures. Did you discuss about these structures in your second year? What about that? Investment in associate and joint ventures? The same thing, right? The same thing applies. So if you take that, again, it's apparent, it seems that it's kind of equity instrument of another entity and that's true. But again, when it comes to the investment in associate, so if you have a significant influence, if you have the joint control, then it is taken care by the other standard. So it is again scoped out from the financial instrument standard. Taken care by uh, LK 27, right? If I'm not mistaken. So that is what take care about uh, the associates and uh, joint ventures. That could be the case. No? Yeah, LK 27. That is a standard, uh, sorry, LK 28. 27, I think it is about uh, the individual financial statement. So that must be LK 28, no? Yeah, thanks. It's LK 28, good. So therefore, if I do a kind of a timeline, so when it comes to this financial instrument, that will help you in identifying uh, the financial instrument. So if I take a line like this, uh, So you can see that if I take this as the 50 mark, I take it uh, here in the middle, the 50 in the timeline. So if you have your investment more than 50% of the shares, right? This is investment in shares. Investment in shares. So if you have the majority, so you know it is investment in subsidiaries. Huh? Investment in subsidiaries. So if your investment is, uh, say it's ranging from, as a rule of thumb, 20% to 50%, what is that? We call it 
investment in associates investment in associates even there can be the joint ventures here when there is a kind of joint control that could also be the case so therefore if your investment is something less than 20% and this is where the financial instrument lies so this is where you can find the financial instrument or it's the financial assets no financial assets so consequently the financial instrument standard would come into play so it become a financial asset so if your investment is less than 20% as a rule of thumb yeah you can say that it's a kind of financial asset scenario but there are instances where even having 15% of the shares it becomes an associate so it has to be uh, it should not be associate so therefore what is less than associate so it's a financial asset right so that is about the investment in shares good okay very correct so you have done it nicely so appreciated the first question you did it really well okay let us now look at the question number 2 so here uh, i'm going to test you your knowledge on the debt and equity debt and equity the classification of debt and equity so there are certain instances i have given there are certain items i would say so having given these items then i ask you to come up with a appropriate classification in the sense whether it's a debt or a equity so when you are going to do so when you are going to do this particular classification uh so here i have given you three criteria right the obligation for principal amount outstanding obligation for dividend or it may be the coupon the interest obligation for dividend or interest and the settlement in fixed number of shares so there are, you know some transactions are there where you can settle them in the fixed number of shares then what i want you to do when i when you come to this particular kind of a arrangement in this particular kind of setting i need to indicate that when you come up with a particular item whether it satisfy out of these three criteria uh, how many uh, criteria get satisfied accordingly what must be the proper classification so if i am to do uh, one together so let's look at this redeemable preference shares with 5% fixed dividend each year it's a redeemable preference shares right if it is said that it is redeemable you know that there is a obligation from the issuer's point of view because we decide the debt and equity from the issuer's point of view so therefore if an entity has issued redeemable preference shares there they have an obligation to principal so that criteria presents then what about the obligation for dividend do you have any obligation so if you look at that so it says that with 5% fixed dividend each year yes so there is a fixed dividend so therefore you have an obligation irrespective of the profits that you make so you need to pay this particular dividend so if that is the case this criterion is also present so this is not applicable the settle in fixed number of shares that is not applicable in a given question if you find that these two criterions are there the obligation for principal the obligation for the dividend and the coupon so what must be the correct classification it's a debt instrument it's a debt instrument no it's a debt instrument right so likewise i want you to try out the rest of the things so you can see that 1 2 3 4 several items are there yeah so let's try that out
So let us take item by item. So you may look at the item number two and let's see. So how about item number two? Yeah. So when you come to convertible, there are both uh, equity and debt component. Could you please explain that? Yeah. So in fact, that we are going to work out some questions on this. So there I will be definitely uh, explaining that. Good. So likewise, you may come up with the coming suggestions here. Yeah. Good. So I'll be definitely attending that, right? Yeah, just try out the second one. So all what you have to do is uh, whether these criterions are there or not. Right. So let us look at that the second one, the convertible bond that convert into fixed number of shares. Do you have an obligation for the principal being the issuer? Yes. So if the holder request at the maturity, if they request the principal amount, yes, you do have to. So the obligation is there. Then what about the obligation for coupon? So throughout the period, let's say that it's a three-year convertible bond. So till the maturity, you have to pay the coupon. You have to pay the coupon. So this criteria is also there. The settlement in fixed number of shares. So when you come to the settlement, so what if the investor opt to take that uh, the fixed number of shares so if they ask you to convert that into the ordinary shares, yes, you are liable to do so. So therefore, this criterion may also apply. Now what? You can see that all the three criterions are present. Right? criteria You can see that this instrument carry both the depth characteristic as well as equity characteristics. Hence, when it comes to the classification, you need to take the depth component, depth component, and the equity component separately. So you need to distinguish, no? You need to distinguish the depth component from the equity component. So you can see that here, both the depth component and the equity component is there, right? So when it comes to accounting, especially at the initial, uh, the measurement at initial recognition, you need to distinguish what is the debt component and what is the equity component, right? So that must be the accounting thing. So if you consider this instrument, so it has both the characteristic, the debt and equity, hence it has implications on accounting. So when it comes to the uh, measurement at initial recognition, measurement at initial recognition, so you need to distinguish the depth component from the equity component. So again, equity component would represent the residual interest. So that is the equity option, conversion option that you have, and the depth component. 
So by forecasting future cash flows, get them divided by the market interest rate that will produce the debt component, right? So in fact, you would have discussed that. So hence, so far from the uh, experience that you have gathered, you can see that the if first two criteria are present, that's going to be a kind of a depth instrument, right? Depth instrument, uh, there you have the obligation for the principal and obligation for the coupon. And uh, if something is settled in the fixed number of shares, if a particular contract is getting settled in fixed number of shares, and that's going to be kind of a equity. It's going to be a kind of a equity instrument. So in case of a convertible bond, that gets converted into fixed number of shares. Yes, it has both the debt and the equity component. Right. So similarly, how about the third one? Okay, good. Yes, uh, we have attempted that. Good, appreciated. So the convertible bonds that gets con that converts into shares to the value of the liability. So what about that? The convertible bond that converts into shares to the value of the liability. So if so, what is that? So if it is a convertible bond, yes, you need to pay the principal amount at the maturity if the investor requests. Then uh, throughout the maturity, so you need to pay the coupon. So that is also there. And when it comes to settlement, here it says that this gets converted into the shares to the value of the liability. Let's say that at the end of, uh, or at the maturity, the value of the liability is say 5 million. Then uh, how many shares that it gets converted? So it depends on the fair value of the shares at that time. It depends on the fair value of the shares at that time. So unlike in the previous case. In the previous case, so in the maturity, you were given the option to convert them into say, 10,000 shares, right? 
let's say that it was given you the option to convert them into 10,000 shares. So at the maturity, let's say it's 5 million, right? So then you can see work out uh, what would have been the value of per share. So this was the case. So it was the 500. So or let's make it uh, more than that. So 25,000 shares or something. So if you are given option as such, so in the maturity, you could have converted this into this number of shares, no? So it's 5,000 into 25,000 shares. Yeah, so per share value, it's 200. So that is something even that is not important for us. So we know what is for sure at the maturity so you can convert the bond into 25000 shares but here the case is different what it says that you can convert this into kind of a uh, shares so depending on the value of the liability so let's say the value of the liability is rupees 5 million the value of the liability is 5 million so at the time let's say the market price per the fair value per share per share value at the maturity 250 so this is what you get so it is five if it is 5000 is 250 per share you'll be getting 20000 shares 20000 shares right it's about him on an api shares we see the hugger to my converting the very well had market price to see a kunana because it would at that time at the times of the maturity what would have been the market price right so therefore we have not fixed on that so we have not made it fixed hence it's going to be a kind of a transaction that is settling the variable number of shares it's a transaction that gets settled in the variable number of shares so a transaction is settled when a variable number of shares so it's a claim it is something that is settled in the fixed number of shares here. make criteria in the criterion, so it's going to be a kind of a depth. So depth. So that's what the accounting treatment should be. So uh, we can see only the word document is that. See the word document. Uh, you haven't seen that. Can you see it? Hope that now you can see it, right? Okay, so here, uh, what was the case? Okay, uh, so I told you that in the earlier case, you have fixed the transaction. At the maturity, you can convert that into 25,000 shares. That's it. But in the second situation, so you have entered into the transaction. So you can convert that into shares, but so uh, that is equivalent to the value of the liability. So let's say the value is 5 million. Then at that time, the per share, the, uh, the fair value of per share is 250, then it would get converted into 20,000. If the fair value per share is 300 or something, so it would only get converted into the 5 million, it's converted into like 16,666 or some amount. So that was the number of shares that you are getting. So therefore it is clear. It's a variable, it's a variable number of shares. So therefore, this is definitely a depth. depth. Okay, then you have the kind of ordinary shares. So what about the ordinary shares? So it's clearly the obligation, no, it's not there. Obligation for dividend, no. Settle in fixed number of shares? No, there is nothing as such. All the three aspects are not there. So the ordinary shares simply represent the residual interest of asset. Hence, that is quite obvious. It's equity. So here you can see that no obligation. No obligation. So that is the most important thing. You can see when it comes to ordinary shares, there is no contractual obligation simply the residual interest.
Then what about the redeemable free franchise? Redeemable free franchise with discretionary dividends. The redeemable free franchise with discretionary dividends. It's redeemable. If it is redeemable, so it's going to be what? Do they have obligation for the principal? The entity? Yes, it does. If it is redeemable, they have an obligation. But when it comes with the dividends, do they have a fixed commitment? No. Do they have obligation? So if you have obligation, if you have commitment, then you need to do it on a uh, regular time interval. But here it's a discretionary dividend. So it is something that is decided by the management. So if the discretion is there with the management to decide whether to pay dividend or not, then no obligation. It's not obligation, is it? That is not the case. Then does that get settled in the fixed number of shares? No. Uh, so here, uh, this was the case, no, sorry. Sorry, this was the case. Because redeemable reference shares in the sense you have a kind of a obligation for the principal, yes, it does. But when you come to the dividends, there is no obligation. So if you wish, throughout the period, you can simply uh, go without paying any dividend or something, right? So that's not the case. Now what? It's a little complicated, isn't it? So there's obligation for principal, but there's no obligation for the coupon and the settlement in future uh, fixed number of shares that is not applicable. What is that now? So what is the classification? What is that? Debt. Uh huh. So debt. Okay. So you are. I would say that you are partially correct, right? You are partially correct. So here, good attempt is appreciated. <clears throat> yes. So it is partially true in the sense that there is a debt, debt component. For what? So that debt is therefore. You need to treat it as a debt for the principal outstanding. For the principal outstanding. Outstanding amount take a take a debt. When it comes to the statement of financial position, so you are going to show this redeemable reference shares under the liability. Under the liability, you need to show that. So therefore, it's debt for the principal outstanding. But when it comes to the dividend. It's a discretionary one. Say that in some time periods you pay the dividend. Apni tum samahar kala pariche the wala apni dividend give wa kiya na. Ito wala apni ek koi thebe niya. Since it's a discretionary dividend, it suggests that there is no obligation. So if there is no obligation, this has to be a kind of a distribution. So therefore, for the dividends, that is equity. It's equity. For the dividend, that's the case. Then what is the implication? The implication is that in a period, if you pay the dividend, you need to take that to the uh, statement of changes in equity, not to the profit or loss statement. You would have seen that. So if you take a kind of scenario, redeemable differentials with the fixed dividend, it is liability and also here liability. In the sense, this must be taken as a finance expense to the profit or loss statement. That is the implication. But here, that is different. The amount outstanding is yes, through its debt. So therefore, show that as a liability. Show that as a liability. Then, so if you take uh, the dividend, so there we have seen there's no obligation. Hence, it must be treated as equity in the sense the implication is that it is taken to the statement of changes in equity during the periods where you 
pay that. So that's why I told you it's partially correct because debt and equity both are there. It's debt for the principal outstanding, equity for the dividend, right? Hope you are getting that. So if you are not getting any, so please do let me know. Right, anything? So if that does not make sense, yes, you can let me know. Okay. The next one, a share option giving the counterparty a right to subscribe for a fixed number of entities shares for a fixed amount of cash. So you are giving the counterparty, you are giving a particular entity a right to subscribe for a fixed number of the entity shares for a fixed amount of cash. Then what is the situation? Fixed number of shares for fixed amount of cash. Okay, good. So we'd like to see more items, yeah, good. Okay, good, yeah. So going in the correct direction, yeah. Good. Right, so we'll see that a share option giving the counterparty a right to subscribe. So there is no obligation. So this is not applicable. So if you take this uh, the obligation for dividend, that is also not applicable. It's a share option. So therefore, this is something which would be exercised in the future, right? Hence, it gives a right to subscribe a fixed number of shares of the entity for a fixed price. So if it is fixed for fixed, Yes, that is equity. So it's settled in fixed number of shares. It's settled in fixed number of shares. That particular characteristic is there. So if you have a kind of a share option that you had allowed, so you can treat it as equity. So it's a part of equity. Yes. Equity option must be considered as such. Very correct, good. Then the next one, a forward rate agreement to deliver as many of the entities own shares at a future days as equal to the price of gold. A forward rate agreement to deliver as many of the entities own shares at a future date as equal to price of gold. So you have a particular obligation Right, you have a particular obligation, you have entered into a kind of transaction. So where that gives you an obligation to deliver as many of the entities own shares. The, uh, the particular transaction will be settling the entities own shares at a future date as equal to the price of gold. Okay, good, yeah. So would like to see more items, yeah. You know, it's a derivative, right? Since that it's a derivative. So you're going to derive the value, but you have not got the previous one. 
Okay, so here you can see that it's a share option, right? So let's say that your entity A, your entity A, right? There's a particular entity, let's say entity B. So the entity B enter into transaction with you. So this is that, uh, let me take it like this, yeah? Your entity, right? Your A, P, L, C. And there's entity that is B, P, L, C. Right? So the BPLC enter into a contract with APLC, let's say today, 23rd, 23rd of January 2021 to purchase 10,000 shares. 10,000 shares in, uh, yeah, 10,000 shares at rupees 50 each. Rupiah Panhagani, sorry, Ekak Rupiah Panhagan shares, Dahada Hagan, 10,000 shares. Shares when? In three months' time. In three months' time. Right? So today is uh, 1st of uh, January 23rd, February, March, April. So 22nd of April 2021. Right, they want to purchase this much of shares. That's the agreement is about. So if you agree, if you agree, if the entity A agrees to do so, then what happens? So this BPLC would have to pay a kind of a, a small premium, say rupees five per share. Then no option my nominal fee you know, but it's a considerable amount, rupees per uh, five per share. So consequently, uh, the APLC is receiving 10,000 shares into rupees 5. Rupees 50,000 would be received. Then, what is that? What that uh, rupees 50,000, how you should treat it? So whether it is equity or whether it is liability. So that's a fundamental question. So if you are to issue fixed number of shares for a fixed amount, it's a kind of a equity instrument. So here the characteristic is that fixed number of shares for fixed amount. So that is the scenario. So there it gives you equity, right? So the transaction is to pay now fixed number of shares, fixed consideration. Equity with the other trade curve. So the transaction is active. The variable number of shares is issued and agreeable here. Yeah, this is transaction uh, in this transaction, let's say for a, uh, to issue variable number of transaction for value be equal to uh, rupees 5 million. We always take 5 million. Now let me take 2 million. E of a cup deno 8. Masa tuna ki mata issue kar under rupees million deka ka. What is the market? Harian shares. Ava the transaction is the Ekanunan Rupial Millionaire. Deca cutter, what is the market? Harian shares. Tika Kishokra. The cutter number of shares the Mithanapi value transaction make fixed number of shares for this settled in. So the same transaction share option. But the conditions are different. What it says here says that to issue. Uh, Kind of number of shares that is equal to rupees two million in value. Million dekha kar whati na kama kita hari ani shares issue karana kira maasal tu na ki. Ita bata apni dehi ham bina kiri to mitra panas dhak pa ki kodi yam kisi mudala ham bina kila premium ka kapi gan. Tar e panas dhak ko humada me e treat karan. If he had to receive fifty thousand, so it is clearly in that situation. It is obligation. Why is that? 
obligation. Why is that? Because the transaction is getting settled in variable number of shares. So only if the transaction is getting settled at the fixed number of shares, that is the what we call the equity. So that's why uh, here we have taken it as a kind of criterion. If a particular transaction is getting settled in fixed number of shares, that indicates its equity. Its equity. So because here uh, you can see that uh, the risk and uh, rewards is retained by the entity. So it's the risk and rewards is retained by the entity. So if it is variable number of shares, so you have transfer the risk and rewards. So if you are committed, if you are committed to issue a kind of fixed number of shares in the sense, so it represents a kind of a uh, risk to you. It's a kind of risk to you because you have agreed to issue fixed number of shares. So therefore, uh, if you retain the risk, it's going to be equity. So if you transfer the risk, so in the second transaction, you can see that. So if you are to issue the variable number of shares to a value equal to 2 million in the sense that you do not retain any risk. Because here the risk is that, so you are exposing, right? So at whatever the market price. So irrespective of the market price, you are still obliged to issue shares at rupees 50. So hence, it's a kind of serious commitment. The method of transaction is a risk. Market price is a risk. So still, he is uh, having that, but he may not be exposed to that because uh, since it's a share option, uh, the NTDB is not going to exercise that. So market take a maker, the hacker take your key at what maker exercise current network make any war and exercise current name may have unfavorable condition make my in sapi to the name local risk have a theory of the bitter maker a pay reward the coming on so the premium what we charge is turn out to be a kind of a reward but there's a considerable or huge risk potential but here there's nothing as such so everything depends on the market price so uh, on this date, on 22nd of April, so considering the market price, so you simply issue the shares. So therefore, it gets settled in a variable number of shares. The transaction is getting settled in the variable number of shares. So it's a kind of a depth instrument. Hope I have answered your question, right? Okay. Now let's move on to the last one. So the forward rate agreement to deliver as many of the entities own shares at a future date as equal to the price of gold. So again, this particular thing is not applicable. This is not applicable. So here there is a consideration, but you're obliged to issue the shares equal to the value of the price of gold. So it's a kind of derivative. So you're going to derive that, but what results in, it will be settled in the variable number of shares. If a particular transaction is getting settled in variable number of shares, that is debt. As you have indicated, it's debt. Yes, it's going to be a debt instrument. Correct. So the transaction is getting settled in the variable number of shares. That's the point. If you've been asked to point out what is the reason, that's what you should highlight. The transaction is getting settled in the variable number of shares. Okay, good. So uh, that's what the second question is about. Okay, so now what we are going to do, uh, so we are going to go for our third quiz. So as you would have indicated, as you would have instructed, so, so we have planned to have some unannounced quizzes. So the ones we have presented here should benefit. So in order to allow you that, so now what we are going to do, we are going to take the quiz. So the quiz, uh, it will allow you 20 minutes time to, sorry, 30 minutes time to perform. And uh, only those who are presented here, so would be uh, eligible to obtain the marks. So this gets recorded 
in the report your uh, kind of uh, numbers what is there it gets recorded so depending on that so you are eligible to take the test right okay then i'm going to stop this lecture for a while and uh, then you can go and do the test so since it takes uh, like uh, 30 minutes time uh, let's say that you start in 720 so it takes up to uh, 50 minutes past seven so we'll be starting or we'll be resuming our lecture so we have discussed one more question that is at uh, 55 minutes past seven right now it is available in the elements you can do that so you can use the same link after that and come to the lecture right hope you are clear so if anything not clear do let me know now i make available uh, the quiz to you so it is something to be attempted within 30 minutes so it's a matter of 10 questions you can easily do that quickly do that so now it is there so you may go and try that out and after that so please come back and then uh, we will continue the third question okay thank you